Um, and so even becoming more alkaline um, helps with a lot of things like inflammation, preserving kidney function, those sorts of things. Okay, <clears throat> so here we are at inflammation. So this is an issue underlying most conditions with chronic kidney disease. All right. So what is this? What am I talking about when I say inflammation? So this is the body's defense mechanism. So under normal conditions, this is a protective and physiological response to harmful stimuli. Okay. So when your body encounters a foreign agent, um, it will send out these first responders and they are, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to use this term. So they're inflammatory cells and cytokines. Cytokines are just stuff. They're kind of like, um, they're, they're first responders, but they go out and bring in more troops, basically, to, to fight inflammation in the body. Okay. Now, there's two types of inflammation. You have acute inflammation, which would be like if I cut my finger and it turns red, that's inflammation. That's the body sending in these inflammatory cells that turn it red and begin to heal that, that cut on my hand. The problem is, particularly in chronic kidney disease, that there is this, it, it's characterized by this low grade, unstable inflammatory um, process going on in the body. And so these increased levels of cytokines, things like C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, these things are just kind of constant in chronic kidney disease. And, and there's a problem with that because um, it's going to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. It's going to increase progression of kidney disease. And so we've really got to address this. All right. So this is, an, this is a way to look at when we're talking about inflammation and diet. So in your body, uh, back in chemistry again, remember that um, in, in an atom, there is this outer shell that has electrons in it. Okay. And in your body, we all have this. We have something called a free radical, or you could call it an oxidant. Um, they are missing electrons. And so what they do is they go around the body and they steal electrons from healthy cells. Um, and the problem with that is that over time, they will damage DNA. Now, you've probably heard the term antioxidant. An antioxidant is the guy on the right who has an extra electron in the outer shell to give to this free radical or oxidant so that you stop that process and you cool down that inflammation. And so what we want in the body is a balance. So <clears throat> with oxidative stress, there's a, stir a disturbance between the pro and antioxidant balance going on in the body. And we know that this disturbance happens in chronic kidney disease. We know that it gets out of whack a little bit, that the oxidants will go a little bit higher. And so we need to bring this back into balance. And so why should you care about inflammation? Well, um, like I said before, it will increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. It increases morbidity, morbidity and mortality. Um, it can cause malnutrition. It can cause you to lose your appetite, cause insulin resistance if you're diabetic. Um, it also can increase things like anemia. So um, and anemia is another, it, your kidneys produce something called erythropoietin. And it's a hormone. And the erythropoietin goes and tells the bone marrow to make red blood cells. So it's very common for someone with kidney disease to be anemic. Um, if you're inflamed, the body will kind of shut down a lot of those processes for making red blood cells because it feels like, think about inflammation, that it, it's, it's almost like sounding an alarm. Your body's saying, hold on, we're inflamed. We've got to deal with the inflammation first um, before dealing with anything else. And so that includes anemia. So it'll start to kind of shut down that process of um, making red blood cells. It'll also increase mineral bone disease, which I told you is also very common in people with chronic kidney disease. We don't want these things. We're trying to preserve your body. Um, and so, uh, and then finally, it will increase the progression of kidney disease, which we're trying to avoid. All right. <clears throat> so I told you I'm going to have to circle back a little bit. Um, there are contributing factors to inflammation. Um, so we have just general, and, and let me say this too, there's things that happen in our life. Okay. Like exercise will increase inflammation in a good way. Um, diet, eating will increase inflammation. Um, but we need, if we don't eat antioxidants, if we don't bring in things to counter that, then that's when we start having problems. 
But with kidney disease, um, there, there are extra factors that contribute to this inflammation that are pretty, um, can be pretty detrimental. And so now we're going to have to circle back a little bit to proteinuria and acidosis. Um, proteinuria, um, before, well, let me just say this before we get to acidosis, proteinuria, um, it's, it's, it's almost, there's a lot of things in kidney disease that are, which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. Um, so I showed you that proteinuria, if it's, if it's, if your, if your kidneys are damaged, proteinuria is coming out right of our, of our colander into the urine, which we don't ever want protein in the urine. But when, when that protein is there in the kidneys like that, coming through like that, that's, that's inflammatory to that glomerulus. So inflammation up here can cause kidney damage, which causes proteinuria. Proteinuria here can cause further kidney damage, which causes further proteinuria. So it's it's very similar. Blood pressure is almost the same way. You know, it's like blood pressure can cause kidney damage, but if the damage, if the kidneys are damaged, then your blood pressure goes up. So there's a lot of things, like I keep saying, are cyclical. Okay, so that's proteinuria. Acidosis and inflammation. So when you have increased acid retention, um, the and the pH goes down because acid is a low pH. You have um increased. Remember, I told you that there were there were three hormones that were increased. Um, and so that is an adaptive response. So the body, the, the response, one of the things that's produced, the body produces something called endothelin one. This is a potent vasoconstrictor. That just means it causes the blood vessels to constrict and it activates that system I was telling you about, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And it's doing that because it's trying to help your body. It's saying we have too much acid here. We're going to activate endothelin one because then we'll, we'll activate that RAS system and get rid of some of that acid. Um, but, but we don't want that happening here. We want to come up higher with our diet and say, you know what? We're going to, we're going to eat a diet in such a way that we have less acid. So the kidneys don't have to do all that. Um, but in the feeling one, even though it seems like, oh, that's a good thing because it's helping my body get rid of acid. The problem is, like I said, it's a potent vasoconstrictor. It causes fibrosis, the scarring of your cells in your kidney. Um, and it provokes pro-inflammatory mechanisms. Um, and we don't want that. And so you can see here that it's, it's a cycle, right? It's going to, um, this endothelin one inhibit that causes the RAS system to go into play. It causes um, the activation of, this is complement and, and pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic pro -fibrotic mediators. That's just saying it's, it's activating your immune system. It's causing your body to kind of go into this thing where we're trying to lower inflammation. We're activating that immune system. And eventually you're going to get scarring, loss of functioning nef nephrons, which then increases nephrons are the functional unit of the kidney, right? Increases progression again. And then now you've got more acid retention because you now have less kidney function. So it's a cycle. Um, <clears throat> and this is just another way of looking at that same thing. Um, but the other problem with acidosis, a, a lot of people with kidney disease, unless it's, unless it's a, um, a lot of times some of the um, genetic conditions that cause kidney damage they um, are, are children or younger people, but a lot of times people are older that have kidney disease. And so if you have acidosis, one thing you really want to preserve as you age is muscle mass. But if you have acidosis, it's going to cause muscle breakdown and less muscle synthesis. Um, it's also going to cause, like we said, less bone resorption. That means bone breakdown and less bone formation. And then it's going to increase progression of kidney disease. Okay. <clears throat> now. Um, we're still in inflammation. So this is another cause of inflammation. So you may be thinking to yourself right now, why is she talking about the gut when we're talking about the kidneys? Um, but everything in your body is interrelated and the gut talks to everything. So gut dysbiosis is a source of toxins and inflammation. Anytime you have toxins in your body, your kidneys are going to have to filter that out. And that includes if they're coming from the gut. So the gut microbiome, you've probably heard of this. Um, you may have even heard someone speak at this conference about the gut microbiome, but basically it's just all the bacteria um, that are in the gut. So you have a microbiome all over your body, but we're today, we're specifically talking about the one in the gut um, and everything you eat affects that. And so um, we'll talk about that, but this is 
it, it's super important. So there's something called the gut kidney axis. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit here in the slides. That the hypothesis. So, so we're talking about the gut. Right now, we're talking about the gut barrier, the lining of the gut, which is going to be similar. What we're talking about, the glomerular barrier. If you have barriers in your body, you want junctions in that barrier to be tight. You don't want spaces. Um, and so now we're talking about the gut barrier. Well, in kidney disease, we think that the tight junctions, they don't look like what's on the left. We think they look like what's on the right. And the reason we think that is because of a lot of times with fluid overload, the belly can become distended. And we know that this happens in people with congestive heart failure. And so they're thinking, well, that must be pretty similar to um, those with, with kidney disease. Um, but also toxins can, can cause that. And the problem when there are separations in those tight junctions is that that bacteria will now leave the gut where it should be and translocate to other parts of the body. And that activates inflammation and can cause um, complications with chronic kidney disease. So another thing about this is you do have the bacteria in the gut and we want them to stay in the gut. Um, those bacteria, they love to eat um, like the breakdown of fiber, which we're going to talk about. They love fiber. But a lot of times people eat a very fiber deficient diet, particularly people with kidney disease, particularly if you have kidney disease and you've gone out on the Internet and looked for something to do with your diet. Most of the information on the Internet is for dialysis patients. Um, and so it it causes which this is archaic too when it comes to dialysis patients, but it's still there um, that it causes um, them to eat less fruits and vegetables because they think they need, people think they need to decrease potassium intake or phosphorus intake, um, which Kate Oki does not recommend, which we'll go over. But if you're not eating fiber, then the bacteria will eat mucus. And why is that a problem? Because there's a mucosal lining inside the gut. And if they don't have fiber to eat, they will eat that mucosal lining, which again causes the gut dysbiosis, which again then lets the bacteria leave the gut and go into the blood and cause a systemic inflammation. Um, so some terms that, that are key to understanding the gut is prebiotic, which is food for the microbes, probiotics. So these are microbes with beneficial qualities. And then postbiotics or metabolites are compounds produced by those microbes. So those microbes in your gut, they produce things. They don't just sit there. And so prebiotics plus probiotics equals postbiotics. Um, so the gut kidney axis. So we've talked about um, uremia and the leaky gut. That's one thing that will lead to an altered gut microbiota and chronic kidney disease. But um, medications do that. A low fiber diet, which we just talked about, do that. And then also we're back now at animal protein. High animal protein causes issues for people with kidney disease. So animal protein, remember, I told you that whatever you eat lands in the gut and it's going to it's going to either feed or starve certain bacteria. And whatever bacteria are thriving, they produce what we call metabolites or, or you can just call them products, whatever you want to call them, but they produce things. And so the metabolites that people who eat a high animal protein diet, what they produce is something called trimethylamine in oxide. So you should say TMAO, p sulfate and doxyl sulfate. You don't have to remember those names, but what I do want you to remember is that those are kidney toxins. And so we want to watch the animal protein and up the fiber. Okay. So people with kidney disease, everybody, but people with kidney disease need fiber in their diet. And so when you eat fiber, your the gut will produce anti-inflammatory products. They're called short chain fatty acids, acetate, butyrate, and propionate, right? So um, these are um, anti-inflammatory, but if you're eating an animal um, an animal heavy diet, not only do they produce those three kidney toxins that I just told you about, but they also, your, your, your gut microbiota will also produce something called secondary bile acids, deoxycholic acid and lithocholic acid. So <clears throat> these are um, very toxic. They are, um, we've known that they can damage our DNA and undermine our DNA repair pathways. So we've known for 40 years that people eating a plant-based diet produce just a 
fraction of some of these these secondary bile acids, about 70% less. Um, if you put people on a plant-based diet within just one week, the bacterial enzyme activity that's needed to produce these secondary bile acids is cut in half. Within a month, the secondary bile acids themselves are cut in half. So <clears throat> we want to eat fiber to increase anti-inflammatory products, short-chain fatty acids, decrease inflammatory secondary bile acids, but also to decrease the production of these 